Hey, good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining in with us this week, whether it's through the radio or through the websites or the, the Facebook, YouTube, social media. However you're joining us, we do want to say thank you and, and welcome. Well, last week, George finished up chapter 16 in our series on Acts. And, and we see chapter 16 concluded with Paul and Silas leaving the city of Philippi after being beaten and imprisoned by the Roman authorities. Today, as we look at chapter 17, you will see where Paul is preaching to three different cities. But you will also see where he received three different responses from the people after preaching about the resurrected Jesus. As we talk about uh, these three responses, you'll notice that once again, some things never change. You see, the attitudes and the actions of these people in response to the gospel are the same attitudes and actions that you and I will see when we share the gospel message today. Let's begin by reading verses 1 through 9 from chapter 17. Now when they had traveled through Amphipolis and Apoll Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. According to Paul's customs, he went to them, and for three Sabbaths reasons with them from the scriptures, explaining and giving evidence that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, and saying, This Jesus whom I am proclaiming to you is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, along with a large number of the God-fearing Greeks, and a number of the leading women. But the Jews, becoming jealous and taking along some wicked men from the marketplace, formed a mob and set the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason. They were seeking to bring them out to the people. When they, when they did not find them, they, be, they began dragging Jason and some brethren before the city authority, shouting, These men who have upset the world have come here also. And Jacob, or Jason has welcomed them. And they, are all, they all act contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. They stirred up the crowd and the city authorities who heard these things. And when Jason had received a pledge, or when, sorry, and when they had received a pledge from Jason and the others, they released them. We see Paul and Silas arrive in Thessalonica. Now, Thessalonica was a wealthy and very influential city in Macedonia. And it was approximately 100 miles from Philippi where they had just came. And we see where, like usual, Paul visits the synagogue first to, to worship with the Jews of the city and to announce that this Messiah had come. Paul spent three weeks in the scrolls, going through the scripture, showing them why they should believe. He, he wasn't just telling them to believe and trusting that they would follow. He wanted them to, he didn't want them to have this, this blind faith. He wanted to show them the truth by using the truth. He wanted to explain to them that their Messiah was not this big, victorious, earthly warrior but was simply a suffering servant. Now it can be assumed that he used scriptures like Isaiah 53 and perhaps Zechariah 12.10, but also using the forefathers' lives of suffering to and, and for Israel also as examples. And through the preaching of the word, many were persuaded to follow, not, not just Jews, but also there was a great number of Greeks and, and leading women as well. And in hearing this, one might think that Thessalonica was, was a place where people received the word with gladness. But in all actuality, it split the synagogue. To some, the, the message made sense. But to others, it was filled with heresy. And this set the city in an uproar. Some of the Jews took to the streets. They went into the marketplace, which, 
marketplace, which was a magnet for, for scoundrels and, and tricksters. And they gathered a group of these bad characters together. And, and it didn't take long for this group to, to fan into a frenzied mob and march to Jason's house looking for Paul and Silas. They, they wanted to bring them out to the crowd, and their intentions were to kill them. They knew that Jason was hosting them, but they did not find Paul or Silas. And when this happened, they couldn't find them. They took the next best thing, and, and they took Jason, as well as a few other brothers in Christ, and they drugged them to the Roman authorities of the city. This, this mob presents to the authorities that these men have been harboring criminals. That have, that have been causing trouble all over the world. Now this, this phrase they used all over the world would more than likely have been referring just to the Roman Empire. Now, I'm sure Paul in his teachings recounted the amounts of persecutions he went through in, in places like Damascus and Jerusalem and Antioch. Everywhere he went for that matter. And, and this was the ammunition they needed to charge them. If he was giving them enough problems for them to be him there, that's what he was bringing to them. But you see, they also put a second charge, and, and this was a more serious charge on them. This charge meant that they defied Caesar's decrees by claiming another king, this being Jesus. We need to think about how this preaching of, of Jesus sounded to that Roman ear. To speak of someone as, as a savior of the world and king and not be the emperor. Well, that was, that was counter-imperial. And this fires up the crowds. And since Paul and Silas were... They, they are who who they are <laughs> and, and they wasn't captured by them they the, these roman authorities let jason and his company post a bond if you will and return home after all it wasn't they they wanted it was paul and silas this is the, this is the first response that we see to the gospel message and it's not that they seen it, that Paul sees it there, but we see the same today. These are what I, I like to call the resistors. And a resistor is, is simply a person or a group of people who do everything in their power to slow down or even halt the progression of something. Now, the response of those who heard and understand Paul's message they were greatly outnumbered by those who were against the message of the Word of God. And even though Paul and Silas carefully combed through and defended the Scriptures, as well as providing proofs of this truth, the vast majority of the people of Thessalonica would not listen. As we go about spreading the truth today, this can be the response that we see as well. Some people will, will weigh the evidence and think, oh, that, that's not for me. And you know what? I, I can honestly say I can accept that answer if, if an honest study of the Scriptures has been made. If they took the time to listen to what the Scriptures said and said, you know what? That's not for me. I'm, I'm fine with that. But many times, just like in Thessalonica, people simply choose to, to mentally shut off the possibility that there is a God, especially a God who requires something from them. And there are also those who will go to great lengths to attack those of us who do not believe in God. Those who don't believe in God will attack us, Christians. There are those out there who, they don't want to listen to any discussion about a God, let alone listening to an expl explanations or or proofs from the scriptures. But there are also people out there who say, you know what? I just want to know the truth. 
But when the truth is spoken, or, or the truth is shared, and it isn't what they believe, or has anything to do with this creator or, or a God, they will instantly resist and shut us off. But here's the thing I wish we could get them to understand. Ignoring the truth does not change the outcome. You know, ignoring the speed limit does not mean that I will not get a ticket. Because the truth is, there is a law against speeding. And in the same way, ignoring God does not change the fact that if He exists, then we are violators and they will receive punishment. Now, though we're talking about resisting God and, and talk of Him, sometimes resistors are even believers. Think about when the Bible directs us as believers to do something or, or to not do something. And we're involved in it. We will look for every excuse. We'll, we will twist scripture. And, and we'll even flat out refuse to follow God's word because it isn't what we like. That's no different than resisting God from the get-go like they were doing in Thessalonica. And you, and you might be saying, yeah, but, you know, they, they got this mob together and, and took matters into their own hands. But I want you to think about something. What do you think you're doing when you go to others trying to get them to see it your way? Or you try to explain to them how the leadership is wrong and, and we should go to them and say, this is the way it's going to be. There's no difference. If there was a difference between us and them it would be that if you're the one doing this you're the one leading the mob L let's move on verses 10 through 15 as soon as it was night the believers sent paul and silas away to berea on arriving there they went to the jewish synagogue now the berean jews were of more noble character than those in thessalonica for they received the message with great eagerness and, and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. And as a result, many of them believed, or as did also a number of prominent Greek women and many Greek men. But when the Jews in Thessalonica learned that Paul was preaching the word of God at Berea, some of them went there too, agitating the crowds and stirring them up. The believers immediately sent Paul to the coast, but Silas and Timothy stayed at Berea. Those who escorted Paul brought him to Athens and then left with instructions for Silas and Timothy to join him as soon as possible. Now, after being united back with Jason and the brothers, Paul and Silas were instructed to go to Berea during the night. Now, Berea would have been what we call one of those out-of-the-way towns. There's no main roads through it. It's kind of out of the way to go through it to get somewhere. But this would also have not likely been a place where Paul's opponents would have looked for him. But, but Paul and Silas were, they, they were hardly whipped pups with their tails between their legs. They weren't going anywhere to hide. Because even though they were flying on the radar, they were not silent nor passive when it came to sharing the gospel message. And once again, after, after arriving, Paul heads straight to the synagogue. He, he immediately sees that there is a difference in character between those in Thessalonica and the Bereans. And Luke says in, in, his, in the book of Acts that they were more noble than the Thessalonians, meaning they were eager to hear the truth and, and test it against the scriptures. They had what it takes to, to grow spiritually. Now, as we've seen earlier, 
typically after preaching the truth in a synagogue, the, the audience would be divided. Some listening and believing and, and the others stirring up trouble. But it was different here in Berea. Here there was a, a great number of Jews who believed alongside a, a number of Greek God-fearers. And these people weren't, they, they weren't people who just believed everything they were told. They took what they were told and they searched the scriptures daily to see if these things Paul and Silas were reasoning to them were true. This is our, our second response from the people that we see in our daily lives. And I, I call them the receivers. Those who will not only listen to what you're sharing about God, but will search the scriptures to see if it's true. Now I know here, here at the port, you've been told on many occasions, and, and I'm going to tell you again today, don't take Mike or George's or my word on what we're teaching you. Go look it up. Go search the scriptures and see if what we're telling you is true. We, we encourage a, an investigation of the scriptures and, and, we, and questions about our actions to see if they conform to the teachings of the Bible. Because believe it or not, we don't know everything. We are still learning ourselves every day. In fact, we, we may be holding on to, to teachings that have been taught for years, but if we find out that they're, they're biblically wrong, we will repent and we will start teaching the truth that is found in the Scriptures. Because a, a teaching that has been in existence for hundreds of years does not make it a correct teaching. But we see people every day going along with the, the received teaching on a particular passage just because, you know, that's the way it's always been taught. So we're just going to keep teaching it that way. But let me tell you, that's the reason the church is in the mess it's in today. We need to think for ourselves and examine the scriptures for ourselves and then be willing to make changes in the face of truth. Regardless of how hard it may be to accept. Now for Paul, persecution was inevitable. But not because of the Bereans. It seems the Jews in Thessalonica found out where he was. And they hunted him down. And once that mob arrived, the brothers ushered Paul quickly to the coast and, and boarded him on a ship heading south. Now, Silas and Timothy, they stayed behind in Berea. And Silas, no doubt, continued to, to teach and train the elders of the new church they established. While Timothy traveled back to Thessalonica and, and to Philippi to update the church on Paul's status. So Paul is now heading to Athens. And that's where we pick up the last of our text for today. Verses 16 to 34. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. A group of Ep Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about, Jerusalem, about Jesus and the resurrection. Then they took him and brought him to, the, to a meeting of, of the Areopagus, where they said to him, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting. You are bringing some strange ideas to our ears, and we would like to know what they mean. All the Athenians and foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. 
Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship. And this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples made by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if needed anything. Rather, he gives himself. He gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man, he made all nations, that they should in inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him. Though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, and now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered. But others said, we want you to hear again on this subject. We want to hear you again on this subject. At that, Paul left the council. Some of the people became followers of Paul and believed. And believed. Among them was Dionysus, a member of the Areopagus, also a woman named Demarius, and a number of others. Now that was a lot there, so, so let's, let's bring this together. As Paul was awaiting the arrival of Silas and Timothy to arrive, he, he was hardly resting. He had been torn in the city. It was the home of Socrates and Plato and the place where Aristotle and Zeno, Epicurus and, and scores of others carried out their careers. He's seen a, a wide array of idols they worshipped. But true to, to Paul's fashion, we see him again in the synagogue, reasoning through the, the messianic claims of Jesus. Now, this wasn't the only place that, that Paul preached there. He also visited the Agora, which was a gathering place for, for business, for, for education, for law. And we, we would know that as the marketplace. As well as the Areopagus, which was a meeting of the elite physiologic, yes, the minds of those who was into all the philosophy. <laughs> it was in the Agora where things got really interesting. Two groups came before Paul and began disputing with him. The Stoics, who inherited their philosophy from Zeno and, and Cyprus. But their beliefs are, are quite compatible with Christianity. You see, they believed that one, the world was created and, and God was in it kind of a, a pantheism to the that the gods determine the destiny of the world three self-denial led to the happiest life since one was not enslaved to earthly earthly possessions and four logos became a synonym for god and and it maintained order in the world but the the stoics denied some key key beliefs as well, such as immortality of the soul and the existence of an, an immaterial world. There was both common ground as well as considerable differences 
which brought about the mixed reviews to Paul's teachings. The second group was the Epicureans, who followed the teaching of, of Epicurus. Now, Epicurus had more devoted followers than any of the early philosophers. But unlike Stoics, no other figure of importance arose from his school. Their motto was basically, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you will die. They believed that pleasure was the greatest good, but that certain pleasure should be avoided if it led to a painful consequence. Let, let me give you an example or two. One would abstain from drunkenness to avoid a nasty hangover. Or one would abstain from adultery if the woman's husband was insanely jealous. Now, aside from this primary belief in pleasure, they also held that matter was eternal, that death was final and not to be feared, that acquiring friends is vital, that humans operate under free will, and that one gained knowledge through logical reasoning in the five senses. Now, if you think about that, that list there, I think there's a lot of people that we come in contact with in the world today that fit in that thought process. But these two groups came and, and they began disputing with Paul. Well, what's this babbler trying to say? Now, now the Greek word here for babbler is spermologos, which originally referred back to the birds that went around pecking around in the marketplace, pecking at seeds in the, in the booths or the stalls. Um, but they would be seen everywhere. It, it was an insulting term for, for loafers and chatterers of low status. But Paul continued to follow the Spirit's lead and, and continued preaching. And, and some of the philosophers continued to argue with him and invited him to speak before the council of Areopagus. One of the, the functions of this council was that of the supervising education and, and controlling the many visiting lecturers. They wanted to know what they were teaching before they let them teach in, in, the, in the marketplace or in the synagogue. Now understand, Paul's not on trial here. But the council wanted Paul to explain what he had been teaching to the people in the marketplace. And just like Paul, he, he takes this moment to preach. And this is what's known as the Sermon on Mars Hill. And in this sermon, there were, there were four main part, points to this sermon. One, God is creator. Two, God is the provider. Three, God is the ruler. And four, God sent a personal Savior. The same thing that, that we are to preach today. Now, the, the, the Stoics and these Epicureans made up the third type of response that we see today. And I like to call those the ridiculers. We see where these Greeks in Athens have two separate reactions to Paul's message. But both can be seen as ridiculing the message. The first of those is those who just ignore the evidence. Now, some Athenians simply mocked what Paul said. They did not engage in debate about the proofs of the resurrection. They did not consider the empty tomb. They did not consider the, the testimony of the hundreds of witnesses who saw Jesus alive. They did not consider the testimony of the Jewish leaders who realized that Jesus wasn't in the tomb. The, the second reaction we've seen as ridiculing in the message was those who demand more evidence. Some ignore it, but this group demanded more. And although some chose to, again, ignore it, these group, they, they demanded it. They wanted more. Some people cannot have enough proof. 
And even with, with a mountain of overwhelming evidence, these things are still not enough to convince some, even some we see today. Now for me, I, I believe that out of these three responses, the, the, uh, the receivers, the ridiculers, or the resistors, this group here is who we will come into contact with most today. Either those who ignore the evidence or those who just continue to demand more and more evidence and still fail to believe. And again, this isn't anything new. Because in the scriptures we see where people asking Jesus, show us a sign or, or we want to see a miracle. And, and he did. He showed them signs and he gave them miracles, yet they still didn't believe. So again, this is, this is nothing new. But when it comes to the resistors, those who just try to slow down the, the preaching, we just got to keep preaching. For the receivers, those who, who want to take in everything they can and they want to research it and, and find the truth out, we got to keep preaching. For the ridiculers, we must find a way to reach them. Now, Mike and Georgia have mentioned a, a class that we will be offering this fall about evangelism. How to evangelize to different groups of people. And in that class, we're going to look at several types of people, several groups of people, and what we must do to reach them. But, but for these people, the only thing I can say about them in this matter is that, that I hope they're never called to be on a jury. You see, as a juror, you're not an eyewitness, but you have to make a determination based upon the evidence. If there are eyewitnesses, they will be presented, but that juror must make a determination based upon the evidence. Demanding more evidence is not an answer, and actually it's a poor excuse. The evidence has been given. You, you can't ask the prosecution for more. You can't ask the defense for more. You have it, and you must decide. And the same is true with God. You are the juror. Now, God has presented the evidence in this world so that mankind would seek, uh, to, seek to find him. But then on the other side, we have atheists and evolutionists, and they've presented their evidence. But now it's time for you to decide. But just remember, God is not on trial here. Your soul is who's on trial. Your eternal existence is at stake. If you reject the evidence, then you are declaring that you are willing to take the chance that when you die, there is nothing. There, there's no accountability. There's no final reward. There's no final judgment. There is absolutely nothing. You are saying that this life in this moment right now is all there is. And if you believe this, then at best, you have a few decades of life left. And at worst, you will lose your life by some accident today. So you better try to find out all there is right now. If you accept the evidence for God, then you are declaring that the evidence is there. Now, you still may have some doubts. But you realize that there must be something to, to life more than this. You realize that our, our moral consciences must come from something. You realize that life in this world must have been created because there has been no explosion that's ever created life in order. Only death and destruction. Your soul hangs in the balance. If there is anything after death, if there is any light at the end of the tunnel, if there are loved ones that are waiting for us, and if, if we are more than just matter that goes to the dirt, then we must get ready. Because God says there will be a fixed day for judgment. 
And what will you do if you're not ready? God has commanded all people to repent and turn to him. We must seek the Lord and do as he commands. His, his commands are not burdensome. And in fact, following God will bring about a sense of peace and, and true joy that nothing else in this world can bring. If you, if you do what he commands, you will be ready to stand on the day of judgment and know that your soul will be spared. Why take this risk? What profit is there to ignore the possibility that there is a God? So we must obey before that day comes. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we just thank you for the gift to be here today, to listen to the words you've put before us. And Father, going out and reaching people, it, it, it's, it's tough. It, it's something that perhaps we may not even enjoy doing because it's so hard. But Father, we know that as, as being your followers, you've called us to do just that. So Father, I pray that you give us the strength we need. You give us the words to speak. You put us in the situations that makes us feel like, we, okay, we can do this. I pray, Father, that for all those who have accepted you and are, are, are believing in you and, and, and have the faith that you have everything in control, I pray that you will use us as, as tools to witness to this dying world, Lord. We know you've gave us everything we need. The evidence is there. So again, Father, just give us the technique to use it, to go out, to win others to you, knowing that there's going to be those who look at us and say, just shut up. There's going to be those who ridicule us. But Lord, we also know there's some that will receive. So Father, again, I just pray that you keep us focused to do what you've called us to do and that we will obey until that day of judgment comes. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Here at the port, every week we, we take the chance to, to offer that invitation to accept God as your Lord and Savior. If you are outside the, the, the life that God has called you to, and, and you've seen the evidence from both sides, and, you, and you've seen where, you know, Maybe there is a possibility. I, I want to try that. I want to live that. Then please reach out to someone, another believer. Talk to them. Help, have them help you through the, these small areas of doubt that you may still have. That it, and if you make that decision, that, that they may baptize you into, into this life. After you've repented, you've confessed God as your Lord and Savior and been obedient to the waters of baptism and enjoy that life that God has prepared for you even though there's tough things that we must do but I but it's it's just a sense of like I said a peace and joy that nothing can ever fill so again please reach out if, if you want to take that step you can call us here at the church office you can stop by most days we're here so if you see us here, stop in. But please, if you, if you want to make that choice, make it today. May God bless.